my mom died of sudden cardiac death about four months after her successful two vessel coronary angioplasty in New Jersey, about a thousand miles from where I was, from where I was living. But it, it drove home, Luke, that trying to manage a dangerous disease like heart disease in a cath lab, in a hospital, was really an awful way to manage this disease. In other words, many people die at home or they die en route, sudden cardiac death, or they have a heart attack and it takes a what? It takes a while to get to the hospital. And maybe an hour and a half, two hours later, you've destroyed more than half of your heart muscle. So this idea that procedures are the solution is just an awful way to do things. So I set myself a, a, a task to find out a way to have people like my mom identified months, years ahead of time so that there was time to take some kind of action. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming to the podcast. Um, just before this, I was sharing, just for everyone listening, uh, how I read your book back in 2022, the book Supergut. And at the time, I was living in a place filled with mold. Uh, I live in, well, not right now, but I used to live in Sydney. Uh, and on the east side of Sydney, there's lots of mold, right? Mm. And I remember laying in my bed and I'd feel like these tingles to the back of my head and the back of my spine. And uh, for me at the time, I didn't see the mold. I lived in places with the mold pretty much my whole life. And uh, I remember walking outside my room and just glancing up and someone had mentioned you know, someone says something to you and then it pops in your head a week later. Someone said mold. It was, my, like, a, it was like an intuition or something. It was like mold, mold. I looked up on the ceiling and it was just filled with mold. The whole roof, in the bathroom, and the house is hmm. quite old, right? And uh, I remember walking downstairs and I'm just like, it's mold all through this house. Anyways, long story short, before I even did that, I, I started to tackle the gut, right? I was doing it informally. I wasn't with a professional. Um, and I, uh, it's very hard to get the equipment uh, like the lactobacillus, rotari and, and things like that in Australia. It's less difficult now, but it was way more difficult back then. But I started reading your book then. And I remember after I started integrating some of the things that you mentioned in the book, after a few days, I started to feel better, even with the mold, even with things like that. So I guess I'd love to, with that note, um, just for the audience and people listening, just a bit about yourself and if someone doesn't know you and, and just a bit about what you do. And yeah, if we could start there, that'd be awesome. Sure. So I started this uh, practicing cardiology, interventional cardiology, a world of doing procedures on people to open arteries, put in stents, drill, <laughs> drill through arteries, abort heart attacks, all that kind of stuff. My mom died of sudden cardiac death about four months after her successful two vessel coronary angioplasty in New Jersey, about a thousand miles from where I was, from where I was living. But it, it drove home, Luke, that trying to manage a dangerous disease like heart disease in a cath lab, in a hospital, was really an awful way to manage this disease. In other words, many people die at home or they die en route, sudden cardiac death, or they have a heart attack and it takes a what? It takes a while to get to the hospital. And maybe an hour and a half, two hours later, you've destroyed more than half of your heart muscle. So this idea that procedures are the solution is just an awful way to do things. So I set myself a, a, a task to find out a way to have people like my mom identified months, years ahead of time so that there was time to take some kind of action. This goes back about 30 years, so it's a long time ago. And uh, the only device that does, the only strategy that does that, and by the way, it's not cholesterol. Cholesterol is a useless, outdated, tech. I, I hate to call it technology because it's so crude, that should have been abandoned decades ago but it, as it turns out, it makes so much money for the pharmaceutical industry that they've managed to brainwash all my colleagues and much of the public on the nonsense about saturated fat and cholesterol and good and bad cholesterol, all that nonsense. The real tragedy, Luke, is that the real cause, everybody's focused on statin drugs and reducing cholesterol and fat intake when the real causes are being ignored. And that's why even in the U.S., uh, over 80 million Americans, 80 million take statin cholesterol drugs, and there's been no meaningful reduction in cardiovascular events. The secret, dirty little secret, is the hospital raises $100 million, put on a new cardiovascular wing because heart disease remains, despite all this, the number one moneymaker for hospitals and the healthcare system and my colleagues, the cardiologists. So there's this kind of silent conspiracy to not know how to put a stop to heart disease risks. So they, there's a show 
of let's reduce saturated fat, everything in moderation, statin cholesterol drugs reduce your, it's nonsense. It's, it's garbage. Mm. Uh, but there are ways anyway. So back then, the only way to identify somebody like my mom at risk would be to do a CT heart scan to measure coronary calcium score. Very simple, very easy to get in the U S you can get it for about a hundred dollars. And we measure calcium because you can see it and you can quantify it. Critics say, we don't care about hard plaque. Calcium is hard. We want soft plaque. That's a, that's a, that's a, uh, a fiction. What the calcium does is quantify total plaque in all, with all its components, soft, hard, in between, fibrous, cellular, et cetera. It's an index of total plaque. And so we help publish these data. If you have a heart scan score, say, of 400, which is high, normal is zero, well, your risk for heart attack is somewhere in the six, seven, eight percent per year range, high. If you do nothing, uh, that score goes up 25% per year. So a year later, 500. A year later, what, 625. And you're getting closer and closer to dying, having a heart attack, uh, or having the appearance of symptoms that justify such things as angioplasty and bypass surgery. Well, we also help publish these data. If you start at 400 and you take a baby aspirin, a high dose of a statin cholesterol drug like Lipitor, 40 milligrams, follow a low-fat diet, exercise program. To this day, my colleagues call that optimal medical therapy. How mm. fast does your plaque grow by your calcium score? 25% per year. It has no impact whatsoever. And so throwing optimal medical therapy at you, you've not impacted the progression of the disease. So what do you do? I, ha I set up a heart scan device almost 30 years ago, we called it Milwaukee heart scan because I was in Milwaukee at the time, scanning people left and right, thousands of people, people like you and me who come in and say, you know what? My dad had a heart attack when he was 58. I'm 50 is the same future ahead for me. You have a scan, your score is 400 or something like that. And what do you do? Well, we put you on Lipitor, aspirin, low fat, 500, 625, where you're freaking out. My colleagues, many of whom are sadly unscrupulous say, look, we'll do the real test, a heart catheterization or, or even a CT coronary angiogram, an angiogram on the CT device. And we'll see if you need a preventive stent bypass or other procedure. Even though the evidence is clear, that does not benefit. You obtain no benefit. You incur some risk and the doctor and the hospital make a ton of money, a ton of money when they do these kinds of, we're talking about tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars per patient and so put the patient in debt financial... as well hmm? and put the patient in debt as well yes that's right that's right so all for no risk and so what do you do i have thousands of people freaking out on me <laughs> and the the experts didn't know what to do they actually said this loop they said well because we don't know how to put a stop to the progression of coronary calcium scores and thereby coronary atherosclerosis don't repeat the test let them have their heart attacks or the appearance of symptoms, and then deal with it then, which of course is ridiculous. That was the whole dilemma, right? That we don't want to deal with the disease when symptoms appear or death appears or heart attack occurs. So it led to a lot of stumbling and trial and error and reasoning. And over the years, I devised an approach. Uh, for instance, when you add vitamin D, which is uh, vitamin D deficiency is widespread. It's ubiquitous. When you correct vitamin D, it was the first time, Luke, when I saw heart scan scores plummet, not stop, not just slow down, but drop. A score of 600 could become a score of 400. And you could actually see the shrinkage of both the calcium and the other elements of plaque. You can't see the other, the softer elements crystal clear, but you can still make them out. And you can see that the plaque had shrunk. By doing things like vitamin D, a higher intake of omega-3 fatty acids, compensating for the loss of magnesium in drinking water from water filtration with magnesium, addressing iodine. Iodine, I don't think is such an issue in Australia as it is in the US because uh, it's inland areas away from the ocean that have iodine problems. And then, but it became clear, Luke, that that wasn't enough. While we had great success with that very simple formula. Oh, and also the diet. Uh, the diet is not low in fat. The diet is eat all the fat you want. Butter, uh, olive oil. When you buy pork, eat the fat. If you're gonna buy ground beef, 
never lean, make it full fat. So not, but addressing the things that cause the formation of small LDL particles, the real cause for heart disease, not LDL cholesterol, the indirect crude way to quantify LDL particles. We're going to measure LDL particles, but especially the small LDL particles, because they're small, they're better able to infiltrate the walls of arteries. They are more prone to glycation and oxidation. They're more, once they enter the arterial wall, they're more likely to provoke inflammation. And they also last in the bloodstream about a week after you consume something that causes formation, as opposed to 24 hours of a large LDL particle caused by fat consumption. So small LDL, perfectly crafted. And now we have 55, 55 clinical studies telling us that small LDL particles are a dramatically superior predictor of heart disease compared to LDL cholesterol. Why don't people talk about this? Because it makes no money. Small LDL particles respond to diet, period. And simple things like vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids. So someone starts, say, with a, somebody has a heart scan score that's high, or they had a history of a heart attack or bypass surgery, we do their lipoprotein. It's called lipoprotein analysis. And they start at maybe 2,400 nanomoles per liter, particle count per volume. We eliminate the causes. And the causes are very easy. Wheat, grains, and sugar. The mm. foods the government tells us to eat more of. The foods that the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, <laughs> all these agents all tell us eat more healthy whole grains that contain the carbohydrate amylopectin A that provokes formation of small LDL particles. Not my speculation, Ruth, uh, uh, Luke. This is well sorted out. So we eliminate wheat grains and sugars, small LDL drops from 2,400 or something like that, typically to zero or other low number. It's not 10% better. It's not 30. It's eradicated more often than not. Uh, and that's when we start seeing people regress or even reverse their heart disease. But it also became clear that we had to pay attention to the microbiome. And as it turns out now, the microbiome plays a big role, not just in heart disease, but in virtually all common chronic diseases from obesity to type two diabetes to autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis to cognitive impairment and dementia, Parkinson's disease, skin rash like rosacea, psoriasis and seborrhea and eczema to emotional and mental health issues like depression and anxiety. So in other words, that had became a huge issue. But the good news, Luke, is that it, became, it gave us even greater control over uh, uh, your health, your future, and your, and by the way, you're also your, your body shape and appearance. Hey guys, before we dive deeper into this episode, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Are you over worrying about having to create content? Are you over that nagging feeling telling you that you should be posting today? or I should have posted yesterday, or I should be more consistent with my content. Well, there's no need to worry anymore because my business, Personify, we focus on helping leaders to grow an online presence. And we do this through content creation. We have a multi-step process where we do all of the clip selection, the strategizing, the uploading of the content, the copyright of the content, the video editing, the graphic design, a whole lot across all 10 platforms. So if you're a business owner out there, or if you're a leader, or if you're someone who has something to say, and you don't have to worry about creating all this content, which by the way, can take upwards of 30 hours each week, then let us know. We're here to help. You can reach out to me on the website, www.getpersonified. G-E-T-P-E-R-S-O-N-I-F-I-E-D dot C-O. It's also the link below. Peace. That's huge. And it's so funny, right? Because you look at those food pyramids and perhaps planned in most Western countries, they're all the same. You go to Australia and the bottom of the food pyramid is all, the bottom, I mean, as in the largest part is all grains, Right. And at the very top, you have like a low fat milk or low fat cheese and all these different things. And I remember when I was, I'm 29 now. I remember when I was, uh, when I was young, I think it was maybe six or seven. It was all the low fat stuff, like low fat yogurt, low fat milk. And, and you look at the ingredients in that, how processed it is. It's like, what's worse, <laughs> obviously the processed stuff. So it's really incredible how, how it's all synchronized across, uh, all countries, perhaps, um, intentionally. So, so it's a, a huge issue. And I think that. And just tying it back to my own personal story as well, because I really believe that 
it's important to share one story to to get a, a point across. For me, growing up in the, uh, I guess you'd say, how would you put it? Uh, cereals in the morning, uh, you know, filled with, I don't know if you have it in Australia. I think it's a bit different in Australia. We don't have the, um, what's that one ingredient that's uh, highly, pro- uh, corn fructose syrup. We don't have corn fructose syrup, but it's filled with all these sugary foods. And I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was six years old. And the doctor said, your son has ADHD. He's got oppositional, oppositional defiance disorder, all these different things. And my mum basically said, stuff what you're saying, I'm going to try something completely different. So she did two things. She changed uh, the food she gave me. So she put me on at the time, as, as far as the knowledge was in 2001, uh, around health. She took me off the sugary foods. She cut them all out and she changed the way she spoke to me. She would say things like, uh, uh, you're, instead of saying you're acting bad or like you're, you're a, um, stop you being bad, he, she would say, uh, right now you're behaving bad. She would make the distinction between it being a state of mind as opposed to a, a thing. But more than the food stuff, she cut out sugars, right? And by extension, you know, cereals like uh, well, wheat bix we call them here in Australia, might be something different in America there, packed with sugar on the top. And as soon as they were taken out, I was a much more calmer kid. And a lot of the process, like not just the sugar, but all the, the other ingredients in there completely changed my behavior as a child and, and the rest of my life as well. Your mom was smart. You know, in some ways, I'm grateful for the flagrant blundering of our dietary agencies in the U.S., like the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the USDA. I'm kind of grateful for how big a mistake they've made because it showed us how raw, how damaging the wrong diet can be. It's about ADHD. It's about obesity and type 2 diabetes and dementia and breast cancer and on and on, hypertension, coronary disease, stroke. So the, the surge in all these diseases has been caused in part by dietary guidelines from the federal government as well as the exploitative practices of the food industry. And so, but you know, we wouldn't know this if 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 the uh, if they all got it right and said, you know what, we never limit fat, we try to get away from consumption of grains, we avoid sugars, uh, we avoid preservatives and other additives in food, and try to get real whole foods like eggs and avocados. And if they had gotten it right, we wouldn't know all these things. <laughs> we wouldn't know that grains are very destructive. We wouldn't know that sugar is completely awful for humans. We wouldn't know that removing fat makes us insatiably hungry. There's so many things we wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have known that the gliadin protein of wheat and grains converts to an opioid appetite stimulant that makes you a victim of the food industry. That's why they put grains in all foods because it turns on your appetite. So there's so many lessons we've learned because they made those mistakes. The, the sad thing, of course, is they're unwilling to admit their mistake for a variety of reasons. Careers were built on this blunder. A lot of money's been made on this blunder. And so no one's going to, we're not going to hear, for instance, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services say, oh, we're sorry. You know what? We misinterpreted the data. Data has improved. Our mistakes have taught us new lessons. We take it all back. We're sorry. We're sorry we contributed to the worldwide epidemic of obesity, diabetes, et cetera. Not going to hear that. At least not in our lifetimes. Uh, yeah, there's uh, in Peter Atiyah's book, I think it's uh, Longevity, the book is called, um, he talks about medicine 3.0 and the shift being that medicine 2.0 was all about uh, uh, you come in with a, a huge problem that's been sitting there for 10, 15, maybe even 20, 30 years in some cases, and we do surgery on it or we do a what's it called, a triple bypass. We do all sorts of things on your body. Uh, you've got diabetes, you've got this, but the symptom was there ages ago. And what medicine 3.0 is all about is preventative. You know, like we we take initiative on our gut health. We we have the right bacteria. We have a diversified diet, for example, and various things like that. And I feel like so I was speaking to a chap today actually in a business, and his business uh, is around uh, helping people to move to medicine 3.0. And I said, have you factored in the governmental resistance you want to feel uh, from that for, for the government putting things in place to stop you from doing that because they will because there's so much money made from it and he sat there and he's like no i haven't thought of that <laughs> and i think it's going to be a huge part of it but um, i'm seeing that shift you know as the saying goes it's like uh, the consumer always makes a choice at the end of the day and if enough people do it there will be a change but unfortunately for the the big farmer and the big companies 
you're going to lose a lot of money. So, And it's going to take generations. Luke, it's not going to happen by next week, next month, next year. It's going to take generations. The current doctors have to, to be honest, die and be replaced by people who are trained differently, have a different perspective and philosophy. You know, personally, I'm not willing to wait that long. I don't want to wait till it's 2090 <laughs> to have this happen. And so that's been my mission to help people understand that your doctor doesn't give a crap about health. He gives a crap about generating revenues for his hospital and himself via dispensing pharmaceuticals and procedures. And so Yet the, the great thing is there's a huge amount of information now that could potentially empower everyday people. And that's what I think you and I are trying to do, educate, inform people that you can do something. Yeah, it's going to take some work. You're going to have to educate yourself. But, you know, if you can convert from a 290-pound obese type 2 diabetic with fatty liver, dementia, and breast cancer risk and heart disease risk into a slender, active, vigorous person who at 70 looks like they're 50, I think it's worth it. Massively. And I have a question. If someone were to take up the standard Western diet, but they manage their stress really well, and we know these foods can cause stress in the body and, and, and various things like that. But if they experienced, or well, they were uh, uh, managing their stress quite well, like say they're meditating, they're looking after their body as far as it goes, but there's you know, no mental stress, no work stress, would those problems still happen? Yeah, because we're we're barraged with things that uh, ruin health. So the diet, the uh, low fat, lots of healthy whole grain diet causes heart disease. It causes type two diabetes. It adds to cognitive impairment and risk for breast cancer that you cannot overcome with exercise, say, or uh, lack of stress. So the, the lack of exercise, inactivity, sedentary living. Uh, stress amplify those bad things, but uh, uh, exercise and managing stress does not eliminate those things. What if you have a disrupted microbiome, gastrointestinal, because you took antibiotics for your acne <laughs> or for an upper res respiratory infection 20 years ago? That's all it takes, Luke. That's all it takes to introduce massive disruptions of the gastrointestinal microbiome, specifically uh, losing very uh, hundreds, literally hundreds of beneficial microbes, uh, species in your GI tract, you know, gastrointestinal microbes, good ones suppress bad ones. And the bad ones are mostly fecal microbes. And so when you lose those healthy suppressive species, these are like fecalobacterium, acromantia, uh, lactobacillus and bifidobacteria species, good species, you lose them. And the fecal species from the colon, the E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, which are familiar to many people because they're also the, the organisms, the, the species of food poisoning. So fecal microbes with the loss of beneficial microbes are allowed to proliferate unchecked and then ascend into the small intestine, the 24 feet of small intestine. And the small intestine is just not equipped to deal with fecal microbes. Uh, the small intestine is by design very permeable. That's where you absorb amino acids and fatty acids and vitamins and minerals. So the small intestine is meant to be permeable, unlike the colon, large bowel, which is impermeable. But when fecal microbes ascend from the colon where they belong into the 24 feet of small intestine, and microbes, of course, don't live for a long time. They live for minutes to hours, rarely days. So there's huge turnover of trillions of microbes in the small intestine that live and die rapidly. When they die, they shed some of their components. One very important component is called endotoxin. And because the small intestine is permeable, endotoxin enters the bloodstream, endotoxemia, and our blood levels of endotoxin go up about 200 to 400% over normal. Not as high as in sepsis, when you have an overwhelming infection where it's about a hundred fold higher, but only 200 to 400, two to four fold higher, but that's enough to add to long-term potential for, but is this, this is how microbes in the GI tract export their effects to other parts of the body, brain as depression, anxiety, cognitive impairment, Parkinson's leaky gut, disease, right? pardon me, leaky gut, leaky gut. Exactly right. Yeah. 
Export to the skin as rosacea and psoriasis. Export to joints and muscle as fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis. So in other words, all modern human disease has to be reconsidered. So yes, yeah, stress is a player there. Uh, diet's a player. In other words, so j just addressing diet, for instance, and stress helps because bad diet, lots of stress amplify these adverse effects. But those adverse effects persist even if you do things good. Yeah, what's that stat in your book? It's like uh, ninety-one percent of individuals in the Western cultures don't have lactobacillus reuteri in their gut microbiome anymore. Is that the right number? Yeah, it's about uh, four percent still have it. Now, if if you and I were to go to uh, New Guinea, take a flight to New Guinea, and then go into the jungles and sequence their their microbiome, their poop we'd find they all, look, they all have lactobacillus rotari. If we were to get the poop of a kangaroo or a deer or a, a, a rat or a raccoon, they all have lactobacillus rotari in their GI tracts. If we were to go to Sydney or Melbourne or Seattle or Washington, D.C. and sequence their poop, no, almost nobody has it anymore, even though those hunter-gatherers and those mammals, unexposed to antibiotics and other things in modern life, they all have it, which suggests that rotari is probably critical for mammalian health, including humans. And so when we replace rotari, incredible things happen. You know, as I mentioned to you before we started recording, uh, rotari was the first microbe I this try started playing with. And as it turns out, it's probably at the top of the list for most important microbes of all. So by sheer dumb luck, I, I settled on a extremely important microbe. So what, what, so this all came from some uh, very elegant work done at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, mouse studies. They were looking at rotari in mice for cancer because rotari is known to have anti-cancer effects. So there's a cancer group doing this research, but they started to see some very unexpected things in this, these mice. Their fur became very, as they said, thick and luxuriant. So they explored what the heck is going on here. They found that the dermal layer of skin that determines skin appearance thickened dramatically, very quickly, by the way. And um, healing time cut in half if there was a wound. They found that elderly mice who had loss of muscle, sarcopenia, had muscle cells restored to big, plump, youthful muscle cells, indistinguishable from young mice. Wow. They yeah. found that the lighting cells in the testicles of males that produces testosterone plumped up and testosterone levels went up 300%. They found that growth hormone went up 300%. They saw that mice given a lousy diet meant to mimic a fast food diet. They saw them stay slender with red rye and not get old. They died looking young when they were older, of course, uh, as opposed to the mice given um, lousy diet with no rotorite, they got old and fat and very unhealthy. So I saw all this. Now, the, the odd thing is they used a commercially available probiotic called Gastris, BioGaia Gastris from Sweden. So I got a hold of that product, but the tablets are made for babies because the BioGaia people have done a good job of funding studies to show that if babies get rotari, they regurgitate less breast milk, they have less colic. Okay, interesting. But the dose was so tiny as to be meaningless for adults. So I propagated it via fermentation. I called it yogurt. It's not yogurt. Of course, you can't buy this in a store. We're using different microbes, and we're going to use my method of, ex of prolonged fermentation. So rotari doubles. They don't have sex, right? There's no, there's no mommy and daddy microbes. So microbes, one microbe reproduces itself, becomes two, two becomes four, like that. Well, rotari doubles every three hours at human body temperature. So I reasoned, let's let it ferment for 36 hours or 12 doublings. Uh, based on the, uh, uh, this kind of a thing, if, if, if we had kids here, I said, hey, which would you rather have, a million dollars or a penny? that doubles every day for 30 days. Kids always say, ah, oh, a million dollars, of course, right? Not recognizing that that penny becomes over five and a half million dollars at day 30. 
But if you look at the curve of the growth in money, the real increase in money doesn't occur till day 27. Same thing with microbes. If rotorite doubles every three hours, a really big increase in numbers doesn't occur till hour 30. Fermentation of factory is typically six hours. Some mm. people at home make it 12. So we're still at the flat area of the curve. So we're going to go 30 to 36 hours, 12 doublings. We count the microbes using a method called flow cytometry, and we get about 300 billion per half cup serving. And so, and we did that. And look, all the things, all this doesn't often happen when, when there's some observations made in mice, they often don't translate to occur in humans. In this case, so far, everything seen in the mice has occurred in humans, both in my anecdotal experience, large thousands of people, as well as our clinical trials. So we're seeing people get the rotari. The ladies go nuts because they lose their crow's feet. Then their smile lines, their skin becomes more moist. They say things like, I don't use uh, skin moisturizers anymore because my skin is, is moist already. They have b better facial contours. You regain youthful muscle and strength. Males get about a 50% rise, not as much as the mice, but it's still a 50% rise in testosterone. So typically a four level of 400 will go to 600. There is uh, acceleration of healing. There is an increase in libido. Many ladies experience in older ladies often have vaginal atrophy, dryness and irritation. Uh, a lot of ladies get back their vaginal moisture and sensation. Uh, immune response appears to be better. None of us get sick anymore. We all, it's almost never get sick. So I'm, I'm talking about over years. And then there's all the effects driven by the boost in the hormone oxytocin. So rotari takes up residence, by the way, takes up residence in small bowel and colon, which is very unusual, sends a signal via the vagus nerve that goes up through the chest, neck, brain, for the brain to release the hormone oxytocin, the hormone of love and empathy. And people say, I like my partner better. I'm closer to my family. I like my coworkers better. I'm more generous. I accept the opinions of other people more readily, even if I disagree. So it changes your social behavior also. And so that's one microbe, Luke. That's one microbe. We wow. see all these changes in body composition, in social behavior, in, in, in the shape of your body, skin, all those things from one microbe. Incredible. And I also want to touch on uh, what I remember reading in the book there around lactobacillus uh, rotari. Once it's in your stomach, does it stay there? Or is one having to take it, say, you know, every second day or every day to keep it there? One of the problems, not just with rotari, but virtually all probiotic species, is if your mom gave it to you by passage through the birth canal, breastfeeding, contact. If mom gave it to you, you'd have it for a lifetime. Barring exposure to antibiotics, preservatives, emulsifying agents, synthetic sweet, all that stuff that disrupts the microbiome. But if mom gave it to you, it should have been there for a lifetime. Of course, we are exposed to all those things and have lost rotari and other species. But if you get rotari or other microbial species as a probiotic, say, or as a yogurt or other fermented food, it takes up residence for days maybe a few weeks and that's it. Why? Well, nobody knows, but the, the assumption, the theory is that uh, microbes need communities. We call them guilds or consortia. That is microbes feed each other. It's just like humans. We don't live in isolation. We have families, partners, neighbors, coworkers, communities. Microbes are the same. Microbe A, let's say Leuconostoc mesenteroides produces lactate that Fecalobacterium prausnitzii needs to proliferate, that in turn produces butyrate, that nourishes other microbes. So we, we don't know, though, what the community of rotari should be. I think in future, probably in a few years, we'll say, okay, what we do is we replace rotari along with these four or five other species. So they cross feed and they take up long-term residence. So, so far, no one's figured that out. The other thing about rotari, as I mentioned, is it's unique. Very few species can do this. You take it and it colonizes the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, the duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum, and the colon. So it colonizes you from mouth to anus. 
It may even colonize other places like the vagina in ladies. So it's really a remarkable organism. And I, I really, truly, by dumb luck, sheer dumb luck, I picked one that is probably the major driver of uh, health, body shape, youthfulness, and gastrointestinal micro microbiome health. Hmm. Are the effects almost instant or is it, uh, will it take a few days to see some of the benefits that you mentioned? So the timeline loop depends on the, uh, on the, um, effect. So the, uh, increased moisture in the skin and increased libido and better sleep, much better sleep develops typically within three to five days, very quickly, very quick. The loss of wrinkles typically takes eight to 12 weeks because you have to uh, build up collagen. And by the way, we measured, there's a method called high resolution skin ultrasound. You can measure the thickness of the dermis. It's the epidermis on the surface. It's the dermis just below, but it's the dermis that's alive and determines skin health. And we measured dermal thickness over three months. We get a 15% increase in dermal thickness, which is hands down better than anything else ever seen <laughs> in skin health. Uh, so um, that takes uh, some weeks. The uh, increase in strength, typically within four weeks, the increase in libido is, is rapid. Um, there are things that take a long time. We know that rotary preserves bone density, but that takes a long time. That's like a year. The one clinical trial where 10 billion counts of rotary was given to older ladies, 75 to 80 years old versus placebo. Placebo ladies, of course, lost a lot of bone density. Rotary ladies lost half as much. That's all they did, just rotarite. No, nothing else. No vitamin D, no exercise, nothing else. Just rotarite. So that takes a long time. So the timeline varies in all, depending on which, which measure you're looking at. And uh, as far as specific strains go for uh, lactobacillus uh, rotarite, is there a specific strain that people should aim for? I think it's like a DSM-75, or is there a certain type that people should aim towards? So... Uh, the strain that we know does this is, and I'm sorry about these strain designations, but it's the ATCC PTA 6475. That's the Biogaia gastris, G-A-S-T-R-U-S, or the Biogaia osfortis. Now, I want to know, are there strains of rotary that are better at it? So because we have limited budget, we don't, we don't have pharma type money. I did a, we did a small mouse trial comparing five different strains of rotary to see if one was better. And so far, we've not been able to prove that one is better than another. I'd like to uh, have a larger budget and, and explore maybe 50 strains <laughs> so I can come back and say, look, these three strains or whatever have a much greater effect. So right now, I can't say that. So we're, we're using the ATCC 6475 strain. That's when it works. Probably the DSM-17938, probably. That's another Biogaia strain, but it's not as well validated. This, the, the majority of studies showing that Rotoride does these things is that 6475 strain. Now, I'm hoping that's going to change over time. Biogaia, the people who uh, commercialized this microbe, didn't even know about these effects. I called them several times, and they had no idea this was all going on. So they wow. found this out by accident. They didn't know. <laughs> they didn't look for it. So it's highly likely, I think, Luke, that we're going to find strains that are better at it. Now I've taken it a little farther also, you know, the low fat, uh, era yielded so many lessons in how not to eat all the things that go wrong when you cut fat in a diet. And one of the things that goes wrong is the abandonment of organ meat consumption. Hmm. So if I said to some modern ladies, Hey, you need to start thinking about eating brain and tongue and heart and pancreas and kidney and liver and stomach. And they'll say, ew, no, it's disgusting. Your great grandmother did. The thousands and thousands of human generations before us all did. And they got plenty of collagen and hyaluronic acid because those are the components of organs. And collagen, when you add collagen and hyaluronic acid to the oxytocin effect from rotary, you get this magnificent collection of effects, a change in the shape of your body and body composition. So we're seeing a reduction in abdominal fat, dramatic reductions in waist circumference. We're seeing greater increase in muscle and, uh, of course, skin. The ladies love it because it 
gets rid of skin wrinkles even more so. And it's not uncommon for a woman who say 70 to say, uh, people are asking me if I had plastic surgery because I look 50. Wow. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, so uh, that's not the most important part, right? The, other, the part that interests me, Luke, is the social part. If you can say, I'm close to the people around me, I like people better. I introduce myself to strangers in line for coffee at Starbucks. I'm more accepting of other people's opinions. That to me is the most exciting thing of all, because of course, we're all living in a period of record social isolation, even putting aside the pandemic, record social isolation, record suicide in the US pre-pandemic. Between 2005 and 2015, there was a 35% increase in suicide. Of course, much worse with the pandemic, but nonetheless, uh, the increase in divorce, half of all marriages end up in divorce now. And the increase in narcissistic behavior. I was not aware that the psychology community has been documenting and measuring narcissistic behavior. They have measures like the narcissistic personality inventory. They track, and they've been doing it since the 1960s. And they have seen a sharp increase in narcissistic behavior. Now, there's probably lots of things that contribute, maybe social media, child rearing activities. and But I think that the loss of rotari and thereby the socialization effect of oxytocin is at least a big player. And we're seeing a reverse with restoration of rotari. Wow. It's so huge. It seems that there's multiple factors that contribute to it, right? There's obviously the the rise of social media and then the the loss of uh, you know, healthy bacteria, which obviously comes from things like uh, antibiotics, um, a lack of exposure to old friend bacteria, um, you know, not being in nature, not having our feet in the dirt, for example, small things like that. I think it all adds up, right? And of course, Luke, that's one microbe. There's plenty more we could talk about that have, at some point, if I said, okay, look, we're going to make a yogurt or other fermented food for every microbe, when it gets a little ridiculous. So uh, I have people have with seven or eight different microbes that are fermenting and get different effects. At some point, what I hope emerges from all this is some kind of unifying theory. We, we can consolidate what we're doing. But it is clear that one of the things we must do is allow return to fermented foods, not just yogurt, but also fermented vegetables, kimchi, kefirs, sauerkraut, all the, you know, the Asians and the Europeans are much better than we are in the U.S. in having maintained intake of fermented foods. Fermented foods are, are, are so interesting, Luke, because the species of, let's say, sauerkraut or fermented meat or kimchi, species like Leuconostoc mesenteroides or Pediococcus acetylactici, I mean, crazy names, right? Or Pediococcus pentaceous <laughs> or Wyzella species or Lactobacillus plantarum. These microbes don't take up residence in the GI tract. They pass through in less than six hours. But in their passage, they do all kinds of great things like produce lactate that are needed by other microbes like fecalobacterium. Fecalobacterium is a very important microbe. You can't get it as a prebiotic as a probiotic yet, but you can feed it things that cause it to bloom, like putting cow manure on your tomato garden. You're gonna, you're gonna have bigger, more tomatoes. <laughs> so we're gonna feed fecalobacterium because fecalobacterium is the primary producer of butyrate. Feed fecalobacterium lactate from fermented microbes Fecalobacterium is happy and makes more butyrate, and butyrate nourishes the intestinal lining, heals it, feeds other microbes, enters the bloodstream, generates better mood, deeper sleep, lower blood sugar, lowers insulin resistance, lowers triglycerides, reduces fatty liver, <laughs> in other words. And so that's just from consuming fermented foods. Wow. Incredible. So let's scale it back to... For someone listening, right, we've gone through all the technical stuff and, and uh, well, I mean, just one slither of one bacteria. But for someone at home who is looking to take some simple steps to, I guess, improve their gut health or rather just improve their life in general, what are some good starting points? Is it as simply as obviously read your book, Super Gut, which I recommend everyone listening? What else is there? Is there a protocol? Is there like, a, you know, just do these three things to start with? What would you recommend? It's, you know, it's a work in progress as the science and experience improves. But right now we know that those fermented foods are critical. 
they are really, really important. And I mean several servings a day, not big servings necessarily. It could be a couple tablespoons of kimchi. It could be the if you ferment pickles, uh, just drinking the juice or eating some of the pickles. By the way, if you buy co- uh, commercially fermented foods are becoming more and more available. So you can buy sauerkraut and fermented pickles and such. What I do, when, when somebody has a factory making these things, they're going to go as fast as possible because that's how you make money. So what I do is I take a commercially fermented food, like let's say kefir, leave it on a kitchen counter for another 48 hours or longer to allow it to ferment long. Most fermented foods are fermented by microbes that do well at, at room temperature. So those, those microbes I mentioned, Leuconostoc, Pediococcus, they ferment at about 70 degrees, give or take. You can do it right on your kitchen counter. When we get into the species like Lactobacillus rotari, Lactobacillus gasseri, Fecalobacter, those are microbes that really like human body temperature. And that's where we have, need a device to ferment it, like a yogurt maker, a sous vide device, an instant pot, something like that. And so we can ferment it because those, they do better. They reproduce faster at human body temperature. So it, it really helps to get that in your head. That is, there's room temperature fermenting microbes and fermented foods. There's human body temperature fermenting microbes that we make our yogurts and other fermented foods in a device. That really helps. So fermented foods, hands down, the most important thing. People say, oh, don't talk to me about these things. I take a probiotic. But a probiotic is the least important thing you do. Because they're so haphazardly formulated that it just throw a bunch of stuff at you. So they're helpful, but they're not as helpful as they could be. So as the probiotic formulation improves, they will become more important. But right now, a commercial probiotic is not is helpful, but not that helpful. So fermented foods. Next, in my mind, is restoring some of those lost keystone like keyst by keystone microbes. Luke, what I mean is so plankton in the ocean, little tiny creatures, right? are consumed by filter feeding creatures like whales and jellyfish. What if there is a reduction in plankton? And by the way, that is happening with the warming of the oceans. You're going to lose the whales and the jellyfish because plankton are foundational or keystone. Well, the two most important keystone microbes you can uh, add back, Lactobacillus rotari, our good friend, and Lactobacillus gasseri. There are others, but those two alone, it's like, it's like, if we caused a bloom in plankton, you'd have lots more jellyfish, lots more whales and successful other species. Same thing here. We're going to replace, and that list is going to grow over time. How to replace it, we're going to have to adjust. But no one wants to make you know, 14 yogurts. But right now, doing rotari, doing gasseri, and by the way, doing rotari and gasseri using my method of extended prolonged fermentation, we sometimes add a strain of bacillus coagulans also. I call it SIBO yogurt. I call it that because to my great surprise, Luke, and when you have SIBO, it can be very difficult to eradicate. That is 24 feet of microbes in the small intestine, fecal, fecal microbes. It makes you sick. It could be obesity. It could be depression. It could be anxiety. It could be rosacea, whatever. So tough to get rid of. You can take an antibiotic like Zyfaxin. Now, wait a minute. If antibiotics got us here, do you really want more antibiotics? So I asked this question. What if you? What if I had SIBO and I took a commercial probiotic? Will the SIBO go away? No, that's quite clear. You might reduce bloating or diarrhea temporarily, but the SIBO won't go away. So I asked this question. What if we chose species and strains that are known to colonize the small intestine where SIBO occurs? And what if we chose species and strains that are known to produce what are called bactericins, natural antibiotics? So Lactobacillus rotari, Lactobacillus gasseri, both colonize upper G- the small intestine and produce a ton of bactericins. I added Bacillus coagulans because it has an excellent track record of reducing the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. IBS is essentially SIBO in most cases and produces two bactericins. So we co-fermented it as those three extended fermentation. So really big, 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 big numbers. Mm. And to my great, so I, what I, I did that in the hopes that it would do some of the agony, the aggravation and discomfort of SIBO. To my great surprise, 90% of about 50 people who've done this convert to negative. 
we're, and I, I say convert to negative because we has we have these this air device now that tests hydrogen gas. If you want to confirm the SIBO, I don't think you have to do this, but if you want to, you can buy the air device. You can blow into it. It registers zero to 10 on your smartphone. It tells you whether you have SIBO or not, it, but it's a mapping device. There's a whole way to do this. So if somebody wants to do this, uh, I would just, it's in my super gut book. Uh, if you buy the device, the instructions aren't quite right. I, I called the inventor, Dr. Angus Short. He's a PhD engineer, and he thought it was just for IBS and a low FODMAP study. So I told him, no, 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 this is a mapping device. So they're, they're changing their instructions. But right now, if you want the proper instructions, is it, it's in the super gut book to use it as a mapping device to tell you where microbes are living. But so far, of about 50 people who've done this, to my great surprise, 90% have converted to hydrogen gas negative. Now, mm. I think it's more towards 100% if you do it longer than four weeks. But uh, I regret calling it SIBO yogurt, Luke, because it sounds like it's a treatment for SIBO. What it is, is restoring keystone microbes. And among the effects is pushing back the fecal species that don't belong in your small intestine and then continue it intermittently after it, maybe three times a week, or something like that, forever. At least until we figure out what you're concerned about. How do we make it take up residence permanently? Don't know yet. So what we do is consume, consume it intermittently because once you've had SIBO, for unclear reasons, it loves to come back. <laughs> mm. And for those listening, SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, just in case we need to know. Quick question. By the way, if you look at all the evidence, US, Canada, Australia, I believe 50% or more of the population has it. We're not talking, I used to think it was rare. It's not rare. It's extremely common. It's among the biggest epidemics for humans ever in the history of our species on this planet. Wow. Now, the, the conventional uh, uh, doctors will start to talk about it as because the evidence is now overwhelming because now there's a drug for it, Zyfaxin. So in the U.S., you know, where they run these ridic ridiculous drug ads on TV, they're talking about Zyfaxin for IBS, not telling you, well, if IBS responds to an antibiotic, they don't tell you it's a microbial problem, right? They don't tell you that part. Okay, it's shocking. So... Um... I'll use myself as an example here. I got my, my GI mapped um, for all the bacteria in there. And one of the bacteria that stood out was Desulfurus piger, P-I-G-E-R. Have you heard that one before? I believe it's a hydrogen sulfide producing microbe. That, that responds quite badly to fats, apparently. Um, my question is, is if someone, um, how do I phrase this? If someone has been diagnosed with having a, a specific bacterial overgrowth in their GI tract, um, is that linked to SIBO? And if so, how? Or if so, not? Yeah, so you can't really diagnose SIBO by stool testing. Stool testing is a rectal testing, right? So if, if you and I had the capacity to test the colon, for instance, every inch of the way, if we go up with a colonoscope, up through the rectum, sigmoid colon, descending colon, transverse colon, ascending colon, cecum, we would find that the microbiome composition every inch of the way is different. But we're making judgments by a rectal sample. So uh, stool testing inherently has severe limitations. Uh, SIBO, of course, is a condition of the small intestine. So if you look at a rectal sample, you really can't because you need a mapping device to really tell where in the GI tract. So, but you can get hints and a hint would be overgrowth of certain fecal type microbes like uh, hydrogen sulfide producers like desulfovibrio or uh, other fecal microbes like E. coli. So if you see an overgrowth, those, it suggests, it doesn't diagnose, but it suggests SIBO. Uh, but one of the things we have to get away from is if we follow the modern medicine model, if you have this microbe, we have an antibiotic for that one. If you have that microbe, we have a different antibiotic for that one. So in other words, we have to get away from that kind of thinking. Because when you have an overgrowth, say, of a hydrogen sulfide producer or salmonella or uh, pseudomonas or proteus or enterococcus, these are all the species of both SIBO and, and dysbiosis confined to the colon. Rather than say, we have an antibiotic for that one. A better way, I think, is to say, we're going to restore order 
and restore lost microbes like keystone microbes, like rotori and gasseri. We're going to feed them with the products of fermented foods. We're going to feed them with fibers that cause a bloom in beneficial species like acromancy, mucinophila, and fecalibite. You don't have to remember these names. <laughs> Your listeners don't have to remember these names, but know that bringing back a healthy microbiome, they'll do it for you. They'll suppress those fecal microbes. They'll suppress the desulfur vibrios and those characters. And so rarely do you have to actually enter with a specific antibiotic. Mm, fascinating. There are exceptions. There are some parasites and some fungal uh, and other species that you have to specifically target, but that's very uncommon. Mm, interesting. Yeah, because I got my whole GI map. I did um the whole protocol around um is it's uh it's it's weed uh seed and feed or a, a sequence like that is that the correct uh, correct sequence yeah i guess you i never heard it said that way but <laughs> you could say it that way right right so went to the process of of uh uh taking certain supplements no antibiotics just supplements to remove that particular bacteria but what you're saying is it makes sense because uh if it's SIBO it's in the the, the upper part right it's not so much down the bottom which means that inside the fecal matter is not going to be any exposure to that it's not going to say oh here look here's SIBO because they're more of a gassy upper tract kind of symptoms. Another good uh, microbe to illustrate this is Clostridium difficile. So Clostridium difficile, if you take an antibiotic, there's a few percent chance you have overgrowth of Clostridium. We say C. diff, which causes a devastating uh, intestinal infection. And you can take multiple rounds of antibiotics, which destroy your health and often don't work. So you can die of this complication. That's why there's this talk of fecal transplant. And fecal transplant is about 92% effective in eradicating this C. diff overgrowth. Now, here's the crazy thing, though. Most of us have C. diff, but it's kept suppressed by all the good bacteria, the bifidobacteria, the lactobacilli, uh, all those fecalobacterium, acromantia. They suppress C. diff and keep it kind of in check or at bay. But when you eradicate those good guys with an antibiotic, that's when C. diff overgrows. So this is true for a lot of these pathogenic species. They're kept in control. They're kept in a little jail <laughs> by mm. the beneficial species. But when you lose those beneficial species, then the bad guys emerge and overproliferate. Wow. It's super fascinating. And for anyone watching, check out Supergut. It's an incredible book. I read the thing cover to cover. I've got a, a list of highlights about yay big. Um, so I really love the work that you're doing and I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, thank you, Luke. I'm glad you're better. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for watching this episode of the Getting Mental podcast. If you like this episode, then you'll love this one here and this one here. Check them out. 